Eastwood and welcome to the team in house. We're so excited to be leading you in a worship song this morning. So sing along. from the worship center, so it'll seem a little more like the regular children's message time. So I have to say, though, Kara, congratulations on getting the camera on every week, nine times. Who knew we could get it figured out? <laughs> that is amazing. So well done, Kara. Yes, yes. Well, Pastor Scott's going to talk today about um, if God is so good, why do these bumps in the road happen? Why do these bad things happen? And that seems appropriate for these times. We've had this kind of long bump in the road and we're not quite 
done with, with it yet. Um, we're starting to see the light, I think, at the end of the tunnel. But I brought some things with me today to talk about that. So, Kara, I have a question for you. Okay. Let's say you're really hungry and you need a snack right in the afternoon. And so you run to the fridge and you know just what you want. And you really want to eat a whole lemon. Right, Kara? No. <laughs> Nobody chooses a lemon to eat the whole thing for a snack because it's... That's sour. It's yeah. sour. It's just eh, too sour, right? Sour reminds me of the bumps in the road, the bad times, um, the sour times, and things that just don't go right. And we just kind of pull our face up at it. Like, that's, that's terrible. Yeah. Okay, what about if I offered you a homemade lemon bar for a snack? Mm, now so, we're talking. Now yeah. we're talking, right? Yeah. You know, it does take lemons to make a good lemon bar. Um, this reminds me how God is good all the time, and God can take these sour times and make something really good out of it. Um, I talked to, or I asked a few families to send in videos to just tell me um, what good has come from this quarantine time um, amidst the tough times. So take a look. One of the good things that have come for our family during this time is getting to spend lots of time together. Like every Sunday night, we've been able to do Sunday night dinners, and it's really been a blessing to get to do fun things that we wouldn't usually do during normal life. Hello, Westwood. This is the Guns. Um, it's great to worship with everybody every Sunday online. Um, our family has really gained a lot during this time um, in the midst of all this scariness and unknown and um, we've just we ourselves have really grown a lot we've grown a lot in our faith um, we have time for um, family dinners we are able to spend just non-stop time together we've been able to spend time together and spend time more in god's word um, and just reading about him and becoming closer to him, which is a huge benefit. God has granted us the gift of time right now, and we just really want to take advantage of it. Um, Claire, what is something that you have benefited from during this time? Um, family board games. Ooh, family board games. We love game nights. Leah, how about you? Um, we're just spending time with family. Spending time with family. It's been really a blessing not having to run from place to place. Um, every day. What I like about quarantine is that we get to play outside more. What do you like about quarantine? I like quarantine about I got to play video games. <laughs> what I've liked about quarantine is things slowing down a little bit, having a little bit more time for family and a little more time to spend with the kids. Maybe a little too much time, but more family time. Ditto. Hi everybody, we're the Galvins. I'm Stephanie, this is Mike and Carabelle and James and Oliver. And although the, this time has been tough during this pandemic. We've been spending a lot of time together. We've been playing games together. <laughs> uh, we've been working out together uh, four days a week. Mommy has us in the gym at uh, around noon when the baby takes a nap and She's getting us very healthy. We're very thankful for that. Yep. And this has given me the opportunity to really slow down, take the time to make memories, enjoy all the moments, and really giving me the opportunity <laughs> to be a mom and to try to build on my relationship and, and build that deeper relationship with God. So, thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Yes. Stay yeah, safe and healthy. Stay healthy. Bye. <laughs> Yeah, thank you to the Turpins, the Guns, the Haskells, and the Galvins for sending those in. I think they represent most families. Um, this has been a hard time, but there have been some really good things that have come from it. It's good for us to remember that. Um, God is good all the time, and uh, it's good for us to remember that and look for the good. Absolutely. So. Yeah, um, this has been a really difficult and trying last few months for a lot of us. Uh, but I can't help but think about one particular group of people that I feel 
especially tender towards, and that would be our senior class, our high school seniors. Um, they seem to have been handed an extra lot of lemons during this time. Um, in a, the last few months where they were anticipating celebrating a lot of their last, those instead were kind of stripped from them. Their last prom, their last um, academic honors, their last sports season, their last performances, their final months at school with their friends, and just feeling like they had the conclusion they were anticipating, even now with their graduations. Um, those things all kind of came to an abrupt end, and our hearts hurt for them. Um, they seem to have been just going through a lot of difficulties right now, and we feel that here as a church too. We feel as if we have been robbed of our final months with them, our final ministry opportunities. We were really looking forward to even including our final summer trip. Um, but although wrapping up their senior year this week was so drastically different than originally planned, this group of kids has been incredibly resilient. I am so, so proud of all that they have not only accomplished, but the way in which they have just carried themselves during this really difficult time. We're excited about where God is leading them and um, the very different paths that each of them are taking and just how God's going to use them through all of that. We can't wait to see it play out. Um, while our in-person recognitions and celebrations have been put on hold for a time, we do look forward to honoring them in a small way now, just as they wrap up their final year. This week, we're going to be posting a little tribute to each of Westwood seniors on Westwood's Facebook page. I would encourage you to just show them some love. Um, give them some extra encouragement this week, shout outs, and um, just let them know that you care for them. Thank you so much for what you do always just to care for our, our kids and our students here at Westwood. Um, we know that you are being the church to them, and um, we just really want to acknowledge our seniors during this time. We will still plan to host, um, hopefully, our typical senior award ceremony and in-church recognition of those kids and their families when time allows for that and when the, the regulations allow for that. But for now, we just didn't want the moment to pass where they are wrapping up their years and um, it's okay to, to celebrate multiple times. So we're going to celebrate them in a socially distant way now and we look forward to celebrating with them in person in the future. So thanks for showing them some extra love as they have been dealt some lemons. We know that God can bring some really sweet things from that. Uh, the Bible verse I've chosen for us for our final memory verse is from Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 8. It says, it is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. And that is my prayer this week for all of us, but especially for our seniors. We are so proud of you. Remember that you do not walk alone. And we look forward to the day when we get to give you a great big hug and celebrate in person all that you've accomplished. Yeah, congratulations, seniors. Congrats. Good morning, Westwood Church. Welcome to worship at Westwood Church, at home worship, which means you're worshiping at home, we're here, and yet we're all worshiping together. Hey, thanks to uh, Kara and Michelle for their part of that. That's always a lot of fun. So I hope you enjoyed that. I know I certainly did. So thanks for uh, being part of that. Hey, this morning, um, we are going to talk about one of the really hard questions of the Christian faith. And it, it works very well in the time that we're in, in this virus time of life. I don't know if you have ever asked the question of God during this time, why? Why, God? I'll bet most of us have. Why is this happening? What's going on? Well, all that is a part of a very hard question about the Christian faith that we want to explore a little bit this morning as a part of our unbelievable worship series. So I'm glad you're here for that. You know, anytime I'm going through a tough time, I always find myself making my way back to the 23rd Psalm. I know it's really familiar, but for me, it's also really comforting to remind myself again that the Lord is our shepherd. So we thought this morning, as we dive into a really hard question, we might remind ourselves about the love of God for us by saying the 23rd Psalm together. It's going to be on your screen, so stand with me if you'd like. And let's confess our faith using the 23rd Psalm. It goes like this. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. 
He restores my soul. He leads me to right paths for his namesake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Well, that's worship. When we say the 23rd Psalm together, Todd and Linda are going to lead us in worship too. Take it away. Here we go. How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord. He is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said? To you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. omnipotent hand when through the deep waters I call you to go the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow for I will be with you in trouble to bless and sing deepest distress how firm a foundation you saints of the Lord he is laid for your faith in his excellent word what more can he say than to you to you for refuge to Jesus have fled let the king of my heart be Thank you. 
Hey, thanks, Todd and Linda, for leading us in worship again. You always do such a great job. Appreciate it. Um, hey, before we go, get any farther, I do want to make a couple of announcements. Uh, we, we put out a bunch of this information last week about when it is that you all might be able to join me here, join us here in the worship center for us to be able to worship in person. Um, I hope you got a chance to look at that update, but let me just review it very quickly for you. Um, this Sunday is at-home worship, as you know, you're already doing that. And then the next two Sundays, um, the, the, the last two Sundays of May, we're going to do a live stream of a live worship service that will happen here at Westwood Church on that Sunday morning, but we will not have a congregation in place. Our, our doors won't be open, but we're going to do the live stream those two services to kind of honestly to get ourselves ready to live stream for the foreseeable future, but also uh, to give you a chance to get used to that. So those of you who are used to watching the service on Saturday night will not be able to do that. The first time you'll be able to see it is Sunday morning, 9 a.m., because that's when it'll go live. And then 11 o'clock, that same service will, will be broadcast too. And then after that, we'll have it on our YouTube channel, all right? So that the last two Sundays of May, live stream, no congregation. And then the first Sunday in June, so June 7th, we will open up the doors of Westwood Church again for in-person worship. Now, we can only have so many people in this room per the governor's health directive, and we're going to have seats blocked off and such. Um, and we'll, we'll have even maybe perhaps one other venue here on our campus. But obviously, we can only have a certain number of people here on those Sunday mornings until the governor opens that up even farther. So we're going to send out a survey before June 7th just to see how many of you are planning on being here in person. But just a reminder, we'll live stream those services just like we, we will starting next week. So you could watch at home and watch a live service or you can come here also. But watch for that survey because we really need to know how many of you to expect here on our campus. And honestly, we'll have to cap that number. And if we were to get to that number, we would have to shut the doors and ask the other folks to go home and watch it on live stream or come back to the 11 o'clock service and such. I think you get the idea. So please answer that survey when it comes. We really need that information. The other thing we need in order to open up our campus again, we need two teams to be in place. A doors team and a sanitizing team. Now what we want is for folks not to be able to have to touch door handles and such. So we want a team of people wearing masks and gloves that we'll provide. We want a team of people opening doors for people and giving them a hearty hello on that first Sunday morning of June um, and welcome them to Westwood. Um, and then between the nine, ser nine o'clock service and the 11 o'clock service, we're going to completely sanitize all the high touch areas and change our seat blocking and all of that. And we'll need a team of people to help us with that. If you'd be willing to be part of one of those teams on our website under connect, 
you'll see a couple of sign-up sheets. And folks, we can't open our campus unless we get these teams in place. So we really need you to respond to that. So respond to the survey and please pray about and consider being part of one of those teams. Then just to let you know, the rest of the Sundays in June, the plan is to have a limited number of people on our campus and live stream two live services, 9 and 11 um, o'clock. And then we'll make decisions about July and August when we get a little later in June and we sort of know what the landscape is, which you, you have to admit changes all the time. So just wanted to let you know about those things. The survey, watch for that. Please sign up for one of our, our teams and let us know if you're planning on being here um, as we start in June. So excited about that. Excited about live streaming too. I think that's going to be a great way for lots of you to connect with Westwood Church. So what we're going to do right now is pray together. And we're going to pray for the, that schedule. We're going to pray for folks who are affected by uh, the virus. We're going to pray for folks who are affected in other ways, not just in health. And for lots of other folks too. Will you join me in prayer? Let's pray. Lord God, we're just grateful to be able to be here. Grateful to know and love you. Grateful that it is true that you are the good shepherd. And you guide us no matter what. So grateful for that. Lord, we ask for your guidance as we enter into this next phase of dealing with this virus as a church. We ask for your guidance as we open up our campus again. We want to be wise, we want to be safe, but we also want to worship together again in every way we can. So we lift that up to you. Provide us with the volunteers we need. Provide us with the wisdom we need, we pray. And Lord, we pray for our live streaming efforts, that they would, be, they would go well. We have a lot to learn still. Help us, Father, to, to get up to speed on that. Father, we pray for people in our congregation, in our families, in our lives who are dealing with this illness. Maybe they, they're dealing with it from a health perspective. Maybe they're dealing with it from an economic perspective, a job loss. Maybe it's just anxiety and depression, which are so prevalent today. Lord, watch over them. Be the good shepherd for them, for all of us. We need you. Lord, we want to be your church in every way we can. We want to represent you well. Help us to do that. And to that end, we pray. Amen. Well, I, I think it was March 15th. March 15th, I think, was the last Sunday that we were able to worship together here at Westwood Church's facility. So that was nine Sundays ago. Over two months. And in some ways, it's hard to believe it's been two months, but in other ways, it's hard to believe it's only been two months, right? Are you tired of this yet? I know. I am too. Just tired of it. I'm, you know what I'm, I'm tired of? I'm tired of hearing stories like a friend of mine told me, a friend of mine from Michigan. Um, he lost his grandfather about a month ago to, to the virus. His grandfather was an amazing man. He actually was one of the engineers who helped bring the Apollo 13 crew home. If you remember the movie or you remember that happening, he was one of those guys with a slide rule and graphing paper, figuring out how to make that work. He was involved in the, in the space program a lot of his adult life. And, and even into his, his elderly years, he was a, a vibrant, healthy man. And then he got the virus and soon he was gone. I, I'm tired of hearing stories about like that. I'm tired of people that I, we all know and love who are ill, who are fighting. I'm tired of people being affected that way. And you know what I'm tired of? I'm tired of, the, of, of worrying about the effects on the economy too. Not because of the money lost, but because of jobs that people have lost. Because every time a mom or dad loses a job, a family's affected. Kids go hungry. And I, I, I worry about that. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of the hit that our country's morale takes. I'm, you know what I'm tired of? I'm tired of the constant grind of bad news that just seems so prevalent right now. That's why, I, by the way, I think John Krasinski's web series, Some Good News, is so popular. I know in our house, we can't wait for it every week. We watch it as, almost as soon as we can. It's so good because the bad news just wears you down. I'm tired of the limitations on life. I'm tired of having to cancel things and change things. And I know that you're disappointed too. And we grieve about that. Of important life events that have had to be changed. And you know what else? I am sick and tired of hearing about murder hornets. Murder hornets? Really? Like we don't have enough trouble as it is? Murder hornets? I'm tired of it. Now I know this will pass. Believe me, I know that it will. 
But for me, it's just sort of a case in point of a hard question about our faith that I talked about a little bit earlier. Since this started, maybe a lot of us have asked God, why God? Why a pandemic? Why a job loss? Why an illness? Why? Have you asked God what's going on right now about that? Or have you maybe in the past ever said to God, why? About some terrible, tragic thing that happened in your life. I'll bet you have. I mean, of course you have. We all have. And when we do that, we're really just asking a hard question that's been asked about the Christian faith really from the beginning. Now, the common name for this question is the problem of evil. Maybe you've heard that. The problem of evil. But really, it goes like this. If there is a God, and that God is all-powerful and all-loving, then how in the world do we explain the fact that evil exists and that innocent people suffer? And of course, uh, I guess the more personal version of that question is, why God? Why me? Why now? Why? Is there somebody driving the boat here? Do you even care? And, it can, and the conclusion that a lot of people have drawn to that question is either God doesn't exist at all, or he's not all loving, or he's not all powerful. And yet, for those of us who, who claim the Christian faith as a bedrock for our lives, that's just not a very satisfying answer, is it? I mean, we believe in an all-powerful, all-loving God. So how do we deal with that? How do we deal with, do we account for the wrongs in our world and yet belief in God? That, my friends, is the question. That's the problem of evil question. And it, it's a tough one. You know, I read this week that more people disbelieve in God because of the suffering, uh, suffering of innocent in this world than any other issue. And I don't have any problem believing that. I mean, truthfully, the problem of evil is not a question. It is the question that we have to deal with. But folks, I want you to know something. It's not a question that doesn't have some answers. So what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about that by reading two scripture passages, uh, two chapters, two psalms, one right after another, Psalm 10 and Psalm 11. So I'd like to read Psalm 10 and Psalm 11. So open your Bibles, if you would, to Psalm 10, because I'm going to read Psalm 10 first, because it is a beautiful, poetic description of this problem that we're tackling together this morning. And then once I've talked about that a bit, I want to read Psalm 11, because I think Psalm 11 offers us some reasons and some hope that are really important. So let's dive in. I'm going to ask you to open your Bible to Psalm 10, and let's start there. And we, we probably won't uh, stand this morning since we're going to read the scripture passage in two places, so I won't ask you to stand, but I guess now that I think about it, you're watching it at home. I won't know whether you stand or not, so stand if you want. Don't stand if you want, whatever. Otherwise, the scripture will be on the screen. Let me read it for you. Psalm 10 goes like this. O oh Lord, why do you stand so far away? Why do you hide when I'm in trouble? The wicked arrogantly hunt down the poor. Let them be caught in the evil they plan for others. For they brag about their evil desires. They praise the greedy and curse the Lord. The wicked are too proud to seek God. They seem to think that God is dead. Yet they succeed in everything they do. They do not see your punishment waiting for them. They sneer at their enemies. They think nothing bad will ever happen to us. We'll be free of trouble forever. Their mouths are full of cursing, lies, and threats. Trouble and evil are on the tips of their tongues. They lurk in ambush in the villages. They wait to murder innocent people. They're always searching for helpless victims, like lions crouched in hiding. They wait to pounce on the helpless, like hunters. They capture the helpless. They drag them away in their nets. Their helpless victims are crushed. They fall beneath the strength of the wicked. The wicked think, God's not watching us. He's closed his eyes. He won't even see what we do. Arise, O Lord. Punish the wicked, O God. Do not ignore the helpless. Why do the wicked get away with despising God? They think God will never call us into account. But you see the trouble and grief they cause. You take note of it and punish them. The helpless put their trust in you. You defend the orphans. Break the arms of these wicked, evil people. Go after them 
until the last one is destroyed. The Lord is king forever and ever. The godless nations will vanish from the land. Lord, you know the hopes of the helpless. Surely you hear their cries and comfort them. You will bring justice to the orphans and the oppressed so mere people can no longer terrify them. My friends, that hard psalm is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. God, we give you this word. Not always understanding everything about it. Not understanding everything about how things are work in our universe. And yet knowing you are the good shepherd and trusting. Speak to us, Holy Spirit, today. Through your word we pray. Amen. Okay. So I want you to imagine something with me, if you will. I want you to imagine that I read maybe the first two-thirds of that psalm, something like that to you. But you didn't know that it was a psalm. You didn't know it was from the Bible. Maybe you're not even that familiar with the Bible at all. But if I read those words to you, wouldn't you say to yourself, that person who wrote that hates God. They're an atheist. They're a church hater. I mean, that would make sense, right? Really, it's quite startling to realize those words are in the Bible. The Bible. We talked about this last week, but I, I sort of feel the need to say it again. The Bible is so incredibly honest. And the Psalms are even more, they're painfully honest. I mean, there are parts of that Psalm that I just read, Psalm 10, that sound very much like an accusation against a God who is unjust and, un, and weak. Unjust and weak, that sounds like the problem of evil, right? Now, in the end, Psalm 10 uh, recovers an image of a God who's sovereign, who will put things right, but it's not till really close to the very end. What that tells me is that our God values honesty, that we can say whatever we need to say to God as long as it's honest. Especially, I think, when our lives are collapsing around us. I just love that about God. I love that about the Bible, this, this honesty that's there. So do you ever feel like the writer of Psalm 10, like the Lord's far away hiding, especially when trouble's at the worst, when you need him the most? You know, when we talk about the problem of evil, there's just no use denying that bad things happen to good people that we've all had. Bad things happen to us in our lives that we didn't feel like we deserved or earned. Um, and maybe even worse, sometimes we see bad people, people who, who seem to do bad things almost without thought, and they never seem to get punished. In fact, good things seem to come out of it. So how's that right? How's that fair? Well, if you've ever been in that position, and who of us hasn't, then Psalm 10 carries your voice. Psalm 10 is actually meant to be read as a corporate lament. What that means is it's meant to be read by a congregant, congregation, a group, but it's meant to express grief, to express anger, to express pain. And the psalm starts out by lamenting to God that he, about his seeming distance from his people when they're in trouble. And then it reminds God about the boasts of the wicked, boasts that seem to have some anchor in the way life really does work. And then it petitions God to punish the wicked, to make right the great wrongs of the world. And in the end, as these psalms of lament often do, it wraps back to a declaration of God's sovereignty, of his eternal rulership. But the undercurrent of this psalm, the heartbeat that runs through it is the question that we all know very well. Why, God? Why? Why? If God is all-powerful and all-loving, then why do good people suffer? Why, does wicked wicked, why do wicked people flourish? Why? And the answer? Psalm 11. Well, not the answer, because there really isn't a nice, neat little answer to the greatest question that plagues the Christian faith. There's not some fairy dust and lollipop, nice, neat little answer to the greatest question that we struggle with. But I think Psalm 11 does provide us with quite a, a few reasons and quite a bit of hope. So let me read that to you. So you still have your finger in your Bible. Psalm 11. It goes like this. I trust in the Lord for protection. So why do you say to me, fly like a bird to the mountains for safety? 
The wicked are stringing their bows, fitting their arrows on bowstrings. They shoot from the shadows at those whose heart is, are right. The foundations of law and order have collapsed. What can the righteous do? But the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord still rules from heaven. He watches everyone closely, examining every person on earth. The Lord examines both the righteous and the wicked. He hates those who love violence. He'll rain down blazing coals and burning sulfur on the wicked, punishing them with scorching winds. For the righteous Lord loves justice, and the virtuous will see his face. The righteous Lord loves justice. The virtuous will see his face. You know, um, we don't know who wrote Psalm 10, but we, we're pretty sure that King David wrote Psalm 11. So these two Psalms aren't necessarily by design a couplet. Um, and yet, I do believe that Psalm 11 answers the questions in some ways, it gives some answers to questions that Psalm 10 poses, that sort of why God question. Psalm 11 offers a few reasons why things happen, bad things happen. And then it offers us some hope when the reasons aren't enough. And the first reason why it gives that sometimes bad things happen to good people, um, even though there's a loving God in charge of the world, the world sometimes doesn't seem fair, is in verse 2. Look at verse 2 with me. It says, The wicked are stringing their bows and fitting their arrows on bowstrings. They shoot from the shadows at those, who heart, those whose hearts are right. So the question is, is why does God allow this? Why does God allow wicked people to get at the upper hand on people who are just trying to live right? Psalm 11 acknowledges what Psalm 10 uh, expounds on. That people often do bad things to good people who don't deserve it. Or to broaden it out a bit, bad things do happen to good people. Why? Well, the implication in this psalm, which is otherwise a psalm about God's goodness, the implication is, God simply allows it. Well, why would God do that? Why would God allow such evil? God must value something so much to put up with all this wrong. And that something that I think God values is human free will. Human free will. God simply values the, the right of people to choose willingly to follow him or not. To do good or bad. God gave Eve and Adam that same choice to do good or bad. They chose to sin. God gives you or me that same choice and we often choose to sin. God wants people who willingly choose to love him. And that means God has to allow them the choice of not loving him. Even harming others. Uh, in, in even sinning. Uh, if he doesn't allow them the choice, then there's no choice at all, right? What do we call things that have a function but don't have any choice whether or not to fulfill that function? You know what we call those things? Machines. Living beings have will. Machines do not. God wants followers, not machines. And that means God has to, by his sovereign choice, allow people to do bad things, even to good people. God has to allow the wicked to shoot arrows from the shadows. But think about it. Would we really prefer a world where we were simply automatons who act out some spiritual programming that we don't choose? I don't think we would. I think even though the, un the world seems unjust at time, given the option, I think we would still choose to choose. Okay, well, if that maybe is some reason why by bad people do bad things to good people sometimes. What about situations that bad things happen where there doesn't seem to be anybody at fault? There's no wicked person acting like uh, illness or, or natural disasters or just terrible luck. Verse 3. The foundations of law and order have collapsed. What can the righteous do? You see, folks, the world that we live in today is not the world as God first created it. 
That was a garden of beauty and purpose. It was inhabited by our ancient ancestors, Adam and Eve. But that world changed, was savaged by that first sin and all of the sins of Adam and Eve's ancestors since, which by the way, includes you and me. In that first world God created, there weren't things like earthquakes or tornadoes or viruses. There was no cancer. There were no terrible accidents. I think we underestimate the damage that sin has done to our world. Not one individual sin, but the sum of all our sins. It has done such injury to creation, that damage has resulted in such harm, so much pain. And it was never God's intent for humans to suffer and die. No, pain and death are direct offsprings of the harm that sin does to God's world. Now, just to be clear, Again, I'm not talking about one person's individual sin resulting in some terrible thing. Although, honestly, sometimes that is true, right? If I, uh, if I smoke 10 packs of cigarettes a day and then I get lung cancer, that'd still be a tragedy, but it wouldn't be all that surprising, right? In some ways, um, my choices led to that outcome. So often there are consequences for individual poor choices, but not always. I mean, that's not really a good answer for somebody who gets Lou Gehrig's disease, right? Or who dies in an accident or who dies way, way, way too young. No, that's not a result of an individual sin. Those types of evil are a result of the damage done to our world by all of our collective sin. The, co the damage that our collective sin has done to God's created order. Friends, we have to understand something. God hates sin for reasons. Sin always corrupts what it touches. Sin always brings pain. So much so that when Jesus comes back and recreates this whole thing, puts it back to where it was supposed to be in the first place, one of the key things he'll do is eliminate sin forever. The foundations of right may seem to have collapsed for now, but that's not a forever thing. Jesus is going to come back and make it right. And this is where the hope comes in. Our hope cannot rest in the belief that nothing bad will ever happen to us because that's a foolish hope. Bad things do happen to everyone. But there is reason for hope. We can hope, I think, because God is still in charge of the world. Verse 4 says, But the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord still rules from heaven and watches everyone closely, examining every person on earth. Even though for now, God allows evil and suffering as a consequence of humanity's choosing to sin. He has not, he will not give up ultimate control of the universe. God is still on his throne. He still rules. And because of that, sometimes God does act to defeat suffering and evil. I mean, not always. I understand that. But I suspect it happens more than we realize. I wonder how our perspective on this question would change if we knew how many times God had intervened on our lives to protect us and we didn't even know it. That car accident narrowly avoided. The time we turned the wrong way and didn't drive into trouble or walk into trouble. That relationship that never happened that would have been caustic for us. That job that never happened that would have been a disaster. Now, how and why God sometimes chooses to act and sometimes chooses not to act, I don't know. That's completely in the purview of God. I mean, that's what it means to be sovereign, right? You get to choose. But I do believe that God sometimes does act to protect us, to limit the harm done to his people. And I think we can hope because God always works, even in times where, where bad things do happen. God always works to bring as much good out of every bad situation as possible. And this is where Romans 8.28 is such a gift to us. You know this verse, right? And we know that God causes all things to work together for good. To those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I want you to note what this verse does not say. It does not say... Bad things will never happen to God's people. What it says is, is that God will cause as much good that to come out of every bad situation as he can. He'll squeeze as much good out of every bad situation, even though sometimes situations are so hard, there's not much good. You see, 
One of the reasons that we can hope in terrible times is to believe in a God who's working for our good. To realize that there are things that, that are happening, bigger realities that we can't even see, that we can't perceive with our human eye, but we can trust. And because God is king, someday all the wrongs will be right. They'll all be put to right. Verses 5 and 6. The Lord examines both the righteous and the wicked. He hates those who love violence. He'll rain down blazing coals and burning suffer on the wicked, punishing them with scorching winds. Folks, even when it seems like bad people win, it's only for now. Even when it seems like evil is in control, that's temporary at best. Because someday, God is, gonna, is going to judge the good and, and, and judge the evil, and he's going to restore the good, and he's going to punish the evil. Someday Jesus is going to come back and he's going to make all this right and all the wrongs will be accounted for. So sometimes we have to rely on our eternal perspective, on our sort of eternal eyes when, we look, when what we look at in front of us looks so bad. We have to believe that the right that comes will make the wrong that we see now understandable. We have to believe in a Jesus who's coming to recreate our world. And in so many ways, it all boils down to Jesus, right? Probably not a big surprise. You know, this psalm was written some 500 years before the birth of Christ. But the last line of the psalm struck me. It says, For the righteous Lord loves justice. The virtuous will see his face. The virtuous will see his face. Now, I'm not claiming that this is a messianic psalm, you know, a prediction of the Messiah or anything, but it does strike me. When is it that humanity saw the face of God? We saw that face in Jesus, the Son of God who came to live and walk among us. And the very fact that everything we face now including suffering and evil and injustice and all that, Jesus also faced. Well, I just happen to believe that makes all the difference in the world. So not only will Jesus make all the rights wrong someday, Jesus took all the wrong that all of us face fully on himself. He suffered as we suffer, and then he took all of our sin and paid the price for that sin on the cross to end the damage of sin someday and forever. The cross, that's God's love and power in action. To say that God is either not loving enough or not powerful enough to deal with wrong is to completely ignore the cross, to speak as if the cross never happened. On the cross, Jesus, the Son of God, exerted all the power and love ever needed to provide us with a pathway to eternity free from evil, while still preserving our free will to choose to follow him. And that godly solution is called grace. And grace is the ultimate answer to the problem of evil. Will you pray with me? God, when it comes to the problem of evil, there aren't always great answers. But these two psalms have provided with some answer, some reason, some hope that help us trust you. And it, in, it does boil down to that. Even when it seems like things are going crazy, we trust you, the good shepherd, who leads us. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil. Because you are with us. Amen. Jesus
Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, breathe, call these bones to leave, call these lungs to sing once again. his fear. He makes the darkness tremble. Go this week and do good things. Thank you. We'll see you.